Okay, so this, um, the next thing that we're going to go over is we're going to start chapter 23, and, and that's going to be like the chest disorders, um, not necessarily the diseases, um, like we're going to talk about in chapter 24, but just some of the disorders that can occur in the chest region. Um, the first one that, <laughs> this looks a little bit like the Ten Commandments, but it's actually supposed to be my representative of the lungs. The first thing that I wanted to talk about is um, the pneumonias. And pneumonia is almost always bacterial related. So it's really important as a nurse to identify um, when pneumonia is starting. And there's um, several indications of pneumonia that's starting. And, and basically all it is is a little conglomeration of bacteria and it usually just starts out in one area of the lungs. Um, the really important thing is to figure out that it, that it is pneumonia. And sometimes you'll start treating it even more before you have a confirmation um, because the key to pneumonia is early treatment. And we treat it with antibiotics because it's a bacteria. Just like any time we have a bacterial infection, usually antibiotics is the treatment of choice. So um, there's four reasons that a pneumonia can occur. Um, aspiration pneumonia, which I'm sure that you've heard about, is um, if somebody vomits or they choke on something or they've um, been immersed um, in a pool or something and they ingest um, things that aren't sterile because the, the pulmonary tree from the trachea, I guess I should have made this look a little bit better, the trachea um, down into here, this is all considered sterile, which is why when you're suctioning somebody, um, you need to maintain sterile technique. So anytime you introduce something that's not sterile, it can lead to, it can introduce bacteria and can lead to what we call it aspiration pneumonia. Um, see your patient, any of your patients that are on tube feedings are at higher risk for aspirations. People who have seizures, because they seize, when somebody's seizing, they can't control um, their, uh, um, the, what am I trying to say, the valve between the um, esophagus and the trachea, so that, um, they often can get food in um, during a seizure, which is why when your patient's having a seizure, you want to roll them up on their side. So if they do um, vomit or have some emesis, it goes um, sideways out of their mouth and that they don't um, ingest it, causing aspiration pneumonia. Um, your unconscious patients are at higher risk for developing aspiration pneumonia. So you want to prevent that because you, you're wanting, you want to prevent the aspiration so you can prevent the pneumonia. Um, the other things, the other, this is an important thing for nurses, is there's something now called um, hospital-acquired pneumonia. Um, hospitals are full of bacteria. There are very um, dirty places, even though we try to maintain sterile environments and clean environments, the people coming in often have a plethora of um, bacteria and viruses and things, so it's, it is a um, big nursing responsibility to prevent hospital-acquired pneumonias or ventilator-acquired pneumonias. Patients who are in ventilators are at very high risk because now you cut that trachea wide open and it's just like when somebody has a Foley catheter in, they're at higher risk for getting a um, urinary tract infection. Patients on um, ventilators are developing what we call VAP, uh, ventilator-acquired pneumonias. And similar to decubitus ulcers and stuff, the insurance companies are not paying for um, patients to receive treatment if they've developed um, a disease process while in the hospital. So hospital-acquired pneumonias, ventilator-acquired pneumonias, they are considered nursing responsibilities or nursing negligence and insurance um, insurances aren't paying for them. And because in um, healthcare is changing so much, it is not um, in comprehensible that nurses will be held responsible and that nurses are going to have to um, pick up the cost because third party payers don't want to pay for this kind of stuff so they're going to blame somebody and they're going to blame the nurse. So good hand washing is imperative. Um, good sterile techniques, you want to prevent aspiration, 
Um, you want to, um, if somebody is sneezing, your patient, family members, anybody else in the room is sneezing and that's carrying um, water droplets. We're going to talk about TB in a minute. That's a big way that TB spreads. Um, you want to teach the, you know, sneezing into your elbow like this. Um, blowing your nose or sneezing into a tissue and disposing of the tissue properly in, an, in um, a proper re receptacle. You're not want, going to want to set it back on the bedside where, where food is and things like that. Um, so prevention is key. Um, identifying the risk factors. So your patients who, who are elderly, um, who are prone to having seizures, on tube feedings, um, anybody who's on bed rest for a long period of time, anybody with any other kind of chronic lung issue where they've got decreased lung capacity, um, chemotherapy patients, cancer patients, those patients are already at higher risk, which means you need to be even more vigilant in your, in your nursing care to prevent the pneumonia. If your patient starts to develop symptoms, and by that I mean they're going to start developing um, dyspnea, a cough, they might um, be hypoxic, uh, decreasing um, pulse ox. In your elderly patients, a classic sign is confusion and lethargy because the, the it takes very small amounts of decreased oxygen to start creating some neuro changes. And when you start having an infection in the lungs, you're going to start altering um, the oxygen perfusion rate. So they can have higher levels of CO2 and lower oxygen levels. So watch for um, changes in neuro status. By that I mean um, you know, confusion, lethargy, irritability, um, you know, if their personality starts changing just a little bit, be alert to that. And then you're going to want to listen to their lung sounds. You and you can um, also percuss, percuss like we talked about last time. It will be duller if there's fluid in an area. That area will be dull. You might hear um, crackles and rails, like we talked about last time. And so you're immediately going to want to get that patient on an antibiotic. Usually, what they'll do is if they suspect a pneumonia. Um, they can get sputum cultures, so they will have the patient, they can either, um, you know, cough or you can suction it or they can do bronchoscopy uh, and get some sputum. They'll send it to the lab and typically what they do, because it, it often takes about 24 hours for the cultures to grow so that they can identify what kind of bacteria it is, so then they, the infection control uh, physicians know exactly what antibiotic to treat it with. Usually what they do is they will start the antibiotic even before they get the results because you can always switch antibiotics. You don't want to give the antibiotics before you take the culture because then it could alter um, the culture. So you get a culture, start an antibiotic, and then if you have to switch antibiotics, no big deal. And if you, you know, if you guessed right and put them on the right antibiotic, then you're already 24 hours ahead, which is given, given this, you know, you haven't wasted 24 hours and just let this bacteria grow. The other things you want to do as a nurse is um, good nutrition, lots of protein, good carbs, um, good fiber, lots of vitamins. You want to um, make sure your patient is well hydrated because well hydrated, uh, hydrated patients can will have um, looser sputum so they can cough it up. You want to teach good coughing techniques, um, P and PD, like that means um, postural drainage so if they have um, an infection down here you can um, lay them up so you can help gravity so that this will um, uh, drain into the um, airways. I don't know what my dogs are fussy about. Whatever. Um, so those are some things you want to prevent it, you want to identify it, you want to treat it with antibiotics and then you want to also treat the symptoms because you want to prevent this from getting worse because it can lead to things like respiratory failure, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, so you, you want to minimize pneumonia as much as possible. Rest, have somebody rest, let their body do what their body does. This is not the time to get up and start running marathons. So. Um, if, if this goes untreated, it can also lead to septic shock, and, and septic shock, we're going to talk about shock at the end of the um, semester, shock is um, inadequate oxygen perfusion to the tissues. Septic shock just means it's caused by an infection. Respiratory shock um, is just, um, you know, because it's, it comes from the, the pulmonary system. Um, and then ultimately, if, if 
the patient gets septic shock because they have a bacteria and it gets into the bloodstream and then they've got sepsis and that's now you've got a systemic wide infection that's much much more difficult to treat than if you just have a localized um, pneumonia so um, most of them are bacterial there is a thing called SARS which is a viral um, bacteria I mean a, a viral pneumonia and they'll identify that once they get cultures um, in a viral pneumonia, like a SARS, you don't you do all of those same things I just mentioned. It's just that you don't give antibiotics because they're not going to be helpful. But you just want to promote the patient's own ability to recover by supporting the patient through rest, nutrition, oxygen, you know, hydration, things like that. Okay, so that's pneumonia. That's what you need to know about pneumonia. The next thing that your textbook talks about is tuberculosis. Um, tuberculosis is... Um, Oh, I do want you to know about atelectasis, which is in the beginning. I think I talked about this um, last time. That's just um, fluid in the alveoli. You want to prevent that, especially after surgery. So you take deep breaths and cough. You want to expand those alveoli because you want to prevent atelectasis. Postoperatively, if your patient starts to spiking a fever just a little bit, sometimes it could be atelectasis developing down here uh, in these alveoli. And then if you can prevent... Um, atelectasis fluid in here if if you can prevent that because sometimes if you just let atelectasis go that can also lead to a pneumonia so you want to um, make sure that you prevent atelectasis and that's in the very beginning of this chapter um, and then I wanted to talk about tuberculosis tuberculosis is um, starts on page um, gosh, pneumonia goes on for a long time. Um, okay, on page um, 586, tuberculosis. Nurses, we are at high risk for tuberculosis. We don't have a ton of it in the United States. It is much more common in the developing countries. It's, it um, occurs much more often in communities where people live in close proximity. They don't have access to good health care. Um, they don't have access to long-term um, drug therapy because tuberculosis, um, we can cure it, but it takes the... Um, the treatment for it is a long time. It takes, you know, six months to a year to cure it. And then sometimes other people that are living in close proximity of the house of the patient that has tuberculosis also has to be treated. Um, patients who have other conditions such as HIV or other um, immune conditions are um, at, a, at a higher risk for developing uh, or getting tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is passed it's a lung disease, and it's, and it's passed um, from person to person through air droplets, and, th and that can last for 6 to 12 weeks. It can stay, um, I mean, 2 to 12 weeks, it can stay dormant. So that could be like 3 months. So you can be exposed to it um, and not even know it, and 3 months later start developing symptoms. And the symptoms are fatigue, um, general malaise, dyspnea, uh, dyspnea cough, um, and then... Um, that's the test that we all have to get as nurses, and it's just that intradermal test, the Manitou test, um, and then some some um, hospitals are doing the um, the uh, Quaifarin Gold test or whatever. But they just slide the needle right under um, the skin. You'll do this as a nurse, and you'll also have to get it as a nurse. And then that wheel, you get the wheel, and then you you come back three days later, and you you're hoping that there's no erythema and no enduration, meaning that it, it raised and got, got hard. If there is some um, erythema, some redness, but no enduration, that's still considered a negative test. But if it's red and it's endurated, um, that's a positive test. And then typically the person who tests positive, then you have to go for a um, chest x-ray to see if there's um, chest involvement. Sometimes there's false positives, and those people um, have to just routinely get um, chest x-rays for tuberculosis. So read about that. Um, because one, as nurses, we are at higher risk for it, and um, two, we have to be treated for it, and three, the treatment when we have a patient with TB is, um, it takes a little bit of work. And, um, you know, then you want to wear the, um, the masks with, because um, it's, it's an airborne transmission kind of a thing. Um, so, to, uh, do read... <laughs> 
Let me see. The risk factors I talked about on um, chart 23.6. And then um, there was a table I wanted you to know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the anti-tuberculosis um, meds are on table 23.4 um, in your book. Th those are, you'll need to know those. I'm sure on NCLEX you are going to get a um, tuberculosis medication question um, because they're kind of common. You do have to, you have to be familiar with the TB um, medications that we give. And also, if you look over on page 588, that kind of shows you what the um, positive TB tests look like. So um, that's tuberculosis, and if you're working, like if you end up going to work for the Peace Corps or you're working, you know, as a missionary in a developing country or something like that, you ought to be much more attuned to this because it is a bigger problem in the developing countries that don't have all of the access to some of these medications. Um, lung abscesses, not real common. It's just kind of a... Uh, gathering of pus in the lungs. And that's not super common. Don't spend a lot of time studying that. I do want to tell you about um, pleurisy. Pleurisy is an inflammation in the lining of the lungs. So you've got your lungs like this, and then and then you've got this um, like this little parenchymal lining all the way around the lungs. You have the same kind of lining around the heart. Um, and what this does, these linings, is um, it just has a little, little thin little lining of fluid in here. Remember how when we talked about you've got a thin little amount of fluid um, in some of your interstitial spaces? This is one of them. And you just have this little fluid in here. And the reason is so that when those lungs expand and contract, expand and contract, it slides. It can slide in and out in the in the chest cavity. So this is kind of a, a you know, then this goes out and attaches to your muscles, and you got ribs that come down like this. And these lungs can expand in and out, and it, it this fluid in here, and this is called the pleuritic space, um, that this fluid acts as a nice little lubricant. Every now and then, this can um, get an infection or um, a bacteria in it, and it's um, called pleuritis. Or sometimes if somebody is very dehydrated and a section of this loses its um, lubrication, then what happens is the lung and the parenchymal lining are actually touching so this is very painful and you you have probably experienced this at some point in your life when you take a deep breath and you get a really really sharp pain and it hurts worse with a deep breath that's pleurisy and because what's happening is this um, lining this lubricant that's in there is all of a sudden gone and so instead of it being able to slide like this it it scrapes like that so it can be caused by dehydration. So if your patient is having that, you you know just and they that you suspect they might be dehydrated, you can increase fluids. Um, it could be caused by inflammation. So sometimes like some steroids or you know just some of the NSAIDs might work. Um, or it could be um, caused by an antibiotic and I mean a bacteria, and then an, you would need to um, put the patient on an antibiotic. So. Um, it, it, it does hurt, so it, you know you kind of have to teach the patient to go <laughs> take little tiny breaths so that it doesn't expand so much until they can kind of slowly get that expanded back out. But that's pleurisy, um, and you should be familiar with that because that's it's fairly common, but not a huge big deal. It's pretty easy to treat, um, and again, you just want to get on top of it ahead of time. The next thing I wanted to tell you guys about is... Um, Acute respiratory failure, which can then lead to something called ARDS. So anytime you have a, um, a condition that debilitates the lungs, it can lead to acute respiratory failure. It can Acute respiratory failure can occur um, like with an untreated or um, an out-of-control pneumonia, um, drowning victims, trauma victims, um, almost anything that... Uh, can traumatize the pulmonary system can lead to acute respiratory failure um, at which point now your job becomes significantly 
um, more difficult and more challenging. So now all of a sudden you're you're making sure that they are well hydrated but not over hydrated because you don't want these, you know, you don't want the patient to get wet lungs. Um, good positioning, you want to keep the patient in a semi followers you want to give um, good oxygen, they may end up needing to be on a ventilator with some um, PEEP added in to help open up those alveoli. Um, when acute respiratory failure, when you can't um, improve that, it can lead into what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is acute respiratory distress syndrome, we call it ARDS, is um, a, a very ominous thing for your patient to get. Um, Google some image searches of it or I'll show it to you in class what that looks like. But when, when you are x-raying somebody's patient, um, lungs that have a pneumonia, it will show up as kind of like a little cloudy spot wherever the pneumonia is. And it's, it'll typically start out unilaterally. Um, and it can be in any of the lobes. You know, you can have a, a pneumonia wherever and it just shows up as kind of, it looks like cotton candy when you're looking at it on x-ray. Um, in a patient who starts developing ARDS, what happens is all of a sudden, all of this lung tissue and these alveoli, which are supposed to be very compliant, they expand, contract, expand, contract all the time, um, they start becoming very fibrotic and they're, they don't move. And so, you know, it's more like this. So air can't get in and out. Oftentimes these patients have to be on a ventilator and the only way to maintain that oxygen, um, carbon dioxide, perfusion gradient is to put them on high levels of PEEP. So they might be on 10 of PEEP for a long time. Um, it, just in order to, it just blows these alveoli open to get the oxygen carbon dioxide exchange. The problem is, like we talked about before, if your patient is on um, PEEP for too long, it'll start blowing out these alveoli and cause barrow, barrow trauma. So it's kind of a catch-22, and they're usually on very high levels of oxygen, like 100% oxygen on a ventilator with 10 of PEEP for a prolonged period of time just to try to maintain some kind of a, um, oxygen perfusion. The other thing that will happen in ARDS is, unlike pneumonia that happens just on one side, ARDS starts doing this thing where it's called a whiteout so that because this is the fibrotic tissue and it'll happen bilaterally which is one big difference between ARDS and pneumonia is that